virtually everyone on the earth, regardless of religion or nationality, recognize that there is some form of battle raging in the world around us between the forces of good and evil. A colossal struggle between light and darkness, truth and error, oppression and freedom, right and wrong, and ultimately, life and death. What is the story behind this glaring paradox? Many religions, including the Bible, teach that beyond the three-dimensional veil of our physical world we see, there's another very real spiritual world we cannot see. In this unseen realm ever about us, we see a titanic battle raging between the supreme righteous hero and the ultimate evil villain. The big question is, who are these primary players? And how, where, and when did this cosmic crisis begin? This is the greatest mystery of the ages and the most amazing true story that has ever been told. This crisis now involves every person on Earth. Yes, every person. Human history has been riddled with scenes of war, and every person has experienced conflict. But to understand the origin of evil, we must travel back in time to the very first war of the universe, because this battle did not occur on Earth. Before our world even existed, there was a war in heaven. Even the words war in heaven sound like the ultimate paradox. It's almost unimaginable to us that there could be a battle and strife among God's perfect beings in paradise. What could have caused this celestial conflict? Thankfully, an ancient book called the Bible gives us enough details so that we can piece together the astonishing account. Although tragic, it's also an incredibly tender love story that reaches down through the ages personally touching you and me and every individual on earth. Our story begins long ago in the very capital of the universe, in a place called heaven that was filled with angelic beings who delighted to do the will of God. Under the Creator's just and loving government, all of heaven enjoyed an existence of happiness and perfect bliss. The supreme prince of heaven and commander of the angels was the all-powerful and loving Son of God. Most know him by the name he took when he came to earth, Jesus. He was one in purpose and mind with God the Father. Heaven, under the compassionate rule of Father, Son, and Spirit, proved to be a place of wonder, peace, and joy. To carry out the commands of God, the Trinity was surrounded by a virtual ocean of countless ministering spirits called seraphim and cherubim, or more commonly, just known as angels. These powerful and intelligent creatures found their greatest joy in doing the bidding of the Almighty. 
But God created one extraordinary angel to serve as leader of the entire heavenly throng. The Bible tells us that his name was Lucifer, which means light bearer. This cherub was the greatest of God's created beings and held the position closest to God's throne and directly under Jesus in heavenly authority. Lucifer's job was to communicate the light and knowledge of God's will to all the other angels. Lucifer was God's most splendid created being. He was captivatingly handsome and endowed with astonishing powers of leadership and organization. Among the angels, he was greatly admired, respected, and loved as a friend. Yet, God foresaw the misery Lucifer was about to introduce into the kingdom of light. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, every precious stone was your covering. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. As Lucifer began to ponder his own beauty and power, his heart gradually started to change. He allowed his focus to turn away from God and he directed his love upon himself. How and why these seeds of rebellion germinated in his heart we may never fully understand. But the prophet Isaiah provides this insight into Lucifer's thinking. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Lucifer gradually began to covet the power of God, but not his character. As he thought about his own extraordinary abilities and beauty, the cancerous tentacles of pride and self-exaltation gripped his mind. This resentment and jealousy ultimately drove him to violate God's holy law and rebel against his government. We need to pause here and make something clear. From the beginning, God ordained the laws of physics to govern the material world we live in. Without these natural laws, the universe would be chaos. In the same way, God's moral law has always provided security and stability to the cosmos. Some believe that the Ten Commandments did not exist until the Lord delivered them to Moses on Mount Sinai. But Scripture teaches us that the principles of God's law have existed throughout eternity, for they're the very foundation of His heavenly kingdom of love. All His commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever, and are done in truth and uprightness. The Ten Commandments are a summary of God's character of love. The first four commandments describe who God is, His power, His territory, and authority. The last six describe what God is like, His honesty, His purity, His faithfulness. All of these things have always been true and will always be true. Now, for the first time in the history of eternity, Lucifer began violating these perfect principles. Lucifer knew if he was to ever share the power and status of God, he would need support. So he went to work. He began to deviously circulate among the other angels, planting seeds of doubt and discontent regarding God's leadership. At the same time, he would subtly highlight his own virtues. He insinuated that God was abusing his divine power, and his law was restricting the true freedom and happiness of his creatures. With his clever reasoning and unrivaled powers of influence, Lucifer managed to persuade a great number of the angels to join him in his mutiny. Perhaps you're wondering, how could so many intelligent angels be duped into following this deceiver? Well, keep in mind, up till this point, no angel had ever heard a lie. And at this early stage of the rebellion, 
the angels did not realize how obsessed Lucifer would become with acquiring the position of God. They did not know he would eventually stoop to torture and murder God's own son on the cross in an attempt to seize his throne. Strangely, Lucifer thought he could conceal his true purpose from God. Woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. They say, who sees us, and who knows us? Don't think for a moment that Lucifer's rebellion surprised God or caught him unaware. The Lord knows all things, including the thoughts of his creatures. He understood exactly what was going through Lucifer's mind, and in loving mercy, God warned the wayward angel of his danger. But in the end, pride and self-love would not permit Lucifer to repent. So he chose open rebellion against God rather than humble obedience. Some have wondered, does this mean that God created a defective angel? No, but he did create Lucifer with the freedom of choice. You see, the freedom of choice is a wonderful thing but it carries with it incredible risk, including the risk of rebellion and the possibility that God's love might be rejected. You see, real love cannot come from a pre-programmed creature, and it can't be forced. It must be voluntarily given. For example, as cute as this little robot dog is, it can never really love me. I can make it appear to love me, but it's only carrying out pre-programmed instructions. It has no choice. On the other hand, this little guy is truly happy to see me. He's chosen to give me his affection. And given time, our relationship would grow and strengthen as I love and care for him. In the same way, a God of love only wants the genuine love of his intelligent creatures. And for that to happen, they must have free choice. Lucifer's rebellion is the greatest evidence that he truly had that freedom. So now, the big question was, how would God respond to this crisis? How would he deal with Lucifer and the millions of angels who joined him in his rebellion? Many wonder why God did not immediately destroy the rebel. After all, he could have easily vaporized Lucifer with a bolt of lightning. But would that have really solved the problem? No, on the contrary, that would have just intensified the doubts and suspicions that Lucifer had been planting in the minds of the angels. Remember, Lucifer knew, as no one else could have, the inner workings of the government of God. His destruction would have been viewed as part of a massive cover-up and fear of reprisal rather than love would have become the motivating reason to serve God. No, the Lord knew in his wisdom the best way to meet the crisis was to allow it to run its course. This would be the only way to ensure that evil would never rise again. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. In the parable of the wheat and the tares, Jesus illustrates that a growing time is needed for a plant to reveal its true nature. In his infinite understanding, God knew, given time, Lucifer's real character would be exposed and the bitter fruit of his rebellion would become apparent to all. Up till now, the citizens of the universe were unfamiliar with sin and where it would lead, but that would change as they came to see for themselves its terrible self-destructive nature. In the end, the wisdom and love of God's government would stand forever vindicated and the universe would be secure. As Lucifer and his supporters brought the rebellion to the forefront, the Lord knew that there would be no peace if they were allowed to remain in heaven. A line must be drawn, action taken, and the rebels evicted. 
But Lucifer and his supporters would never go willingly or peacefully. The next step was war. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The Bible doesn't reveal exactly what weapons were used or how long this cosmic conflict lasted. But this was a war the likes of which no mortal eye has ever seen. Revelation 12 verse 4 tells us that ultimately Lucifer and one third of God's angels were physically expelled from heaven. But what next? Lucifer now had millions of angels on his side, but he needed a staging ground from which to continue his revolt. Soon, all too soon, the universe would begin to understand how painful and costly the wages of sin could be. For the war was not over. It had only just begun. Lucifer, the light bearer, had now become Satan, the adversary. After the war in heaven, Satan and his fallen angels were banished from the courts of glory. For a time, the devil and his demons roamed through the universe unsuccessfully searching for worlds to sympathize with them in the rebellion. In the meantime, the heart of God keenly felt the vacuum created by the loss of Lucifer and his angels. So the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit returned to their favorite work, the marvelous work of creation. They decided to make a new world filled with a myriad of amazing and diverse creatures to love. This new world would be unique because the principal creatures would be made in God's own image. To them the Lord would also give dominion of this new planet we now know as Earth. In the beginning God created the Earth. Then God saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was very good. What an awesome sight to behold. God forming a brand new world, our planet, Earth. And with every wonderful day of the creation, something new and spectacular burst upon the scene. On the third day, God spoke and beautiful lush vegetation sprang into existence. Plants of all colors, shapes, and sizes. On the fifth day, the world was filled with stunning exotic creatures that could either soar through the heavens or glide freely through the blue waters. And some could do both. The sixth day saw the introduction of a vast and diverse multitude of land animals. From the giant elephant to the tiny chipmunk, each found a home in the new planet and a place to live in harmony with the rest of creation. And also on the sixth day, God created man. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed.
What a tremendous honor to be made in the likeness of God, to be a free-thinking, self-governing individual. In the beginning, man was not aware of his nakedness. This was likely because prior to sin, he was clothed with glory and light. God also created the ideal companion for Adam, his beautiful wife Eve. The joyful pair were placed in a magnificent garden, flawlessly designed to enhance their happiness. To Adam and Eve and the other creatures of the earth was also given the divine privilege of procreating in their own image. It was the intention of God that the human race would retain dominion over this perfect paradise forever. Eternally happy and healthy, they'd work with the flora of God's garden while enjoying the affection and companionship of all the creatures under their care. The environment our first parents experienced was vastly different from the world today. Roses had no thorns, insects did not bite or sting, and lions and lambs would gently frolic together. But the greatest blessing was that humans lived in perfect harmony with their maker. Every seventh day, Adam and Eve would rest from their pleasant labor and hold open, blissful communion with their visiting Creator. It was a splendid, wonderful world, and this happy estate would have continued through eternity if only our first parents had proved faithful in one simple test. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Because the adversary had contaminated the universe with his rebellion, the Lord saw the need of a simple test of love and loyalty. Remember, the good angels had just seen a third of their friends cast out of heaven during the war. How could they be assured these new humans would not side with Lucifer and cause more trouble? So the Lord placed a unique tree in the Garden of Eden, a tree whose fruit was not to be eaten on pain of death. Passing this simple test of obedience would demonstrate Adam and Eve's allegiance to God and faith in His Word. Even more, it was a test of love. This is why Jesus said in John 14, If you love me, keep my commandments. But someone else learned of this test of faith and he determined to use it to his advantage. Satan was very jealous of the happy humans who were now enjoying the blessed life that he had lost. Their happy existence stood in stark contrast to his own, which was now full of guilt, sin, and misery. In his brooding resentment and anger, he was not content to leave the innocent pair alone, for sin always seeks to drag others down with it. And so one day, as Eve was engaged in her pleasant work, she found herself alone and perilously close to the forbidden tree. It was then that Satan saw his opportunity. Using a mesmerizing serpent as his medium, the fallen angel called to Eve from the tree and thought to engage her in conversation. His charming words were carefully calculated to instill a distrust of God. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Tragically, as Eve listened to the smooth, silky voice of the tempter, she began to entertain doubts about God's word. The serpent enticed her with the promise of enhanced power and wisdom. She found this appealing. 
After all, the fruit had apparently given the snake the ability to speak. What other powers might it give her? And so even though she had just met the serpent, she trusted his word above God who had created her and provided her paradise home. So Eve ate the forbidden fruit and soon after persuaded her husband to do the same. Adam could have chosen to remain loyal to God, but he put his love for his wife above his love for God. As our first parents gave their allegiance to the enemy, the dominion of the earth was claimed by Satan. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey? No one can serve two masters. This world would now become the ultimate battlefield between good and evil, and the hearts of every man and woman the prize. Little did Adam and Eve realize it at the time, but their one moment of distrust and defiance would open the floodgates of suffering on millions of people for thousands of years. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Our first parents soon began to face the terrible results of their sin. In their holy state, Adam and Eve glowed with robes of glory. After they sinned, these natural robes of light faded, and they became mortified by a sense of their nakedness. Shame and fear replaced their joy and peace, and they sought to cover their nakedness with leaves. They now also found themselves under the constant influence of the devil. Giving in to temptation had weakened their very natures, and Satan had gained a new power over humanity. People could no longer resist the temptations of the devil in their own strength. Lastly, and most terrifying, they found themselves living under a looming death sentence. God had warned them that disobedience would bring death. They had already experienced the spiritual death. How long until they suffered physical death as well? At this point, their future held nothing but darkness and despair. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way, to guard the way to the tree of life. Just as sin caused the fallen angels to be expelled from their heavenly home, so now, because of disobedience, Adam and Eve were driven from their garden home in paradise. Everything around them was quickly changing, and humankind found itself susceptible to heartache, disease, and finally death. Even the animals and plants were infected by the terrible curse Thorns and thistles now appeared on trees and flowers, and animals that had formerly been gentle began to kill and devour one another. The worst result was sin had separated humanity from God. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. At creation, Adam and Eve were given the honor of speaking with the angels and even God the Son face to face. But God is so perfectly pure and holy that no evil can exist in His presence. Now that the first humans had sinned, God withdrew His holy presence from them for their own protection. Sin had burned a cataract on the soul of man so he could no longer see the spiritual dimension. From this time on, direct communication with heaven would be limited. As all of these curses fell upon Adam and Eve, the Lord's heart was deeply moved with tender compassion. The law that they had broken could not be altered to save them, for it's as sacred and unchanging as God Himself. The Lord knew there was only one way that man could be redeemed. So a plan was revealed, born from the very heart of God, a plan to save man from his appointment with eternal death and to restore everything that had been lost through sin. It would be an amazing endeavor in its depth, scope, and power, but it was a plan that would also involve an enormous sacrifice.
God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The scriptures clearly teach in Romans 6.23 that the wages for sin are death. The broken law demanded the life of the sinner and there was only one in all the universe who could qualify as a substitute for humanity. The Creator alone could pay the debt of His creatures by standing in their place. So, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, willingly agreed to leave the purity, glory, and safety of heaven. He would come to die in man's behalf on this wicked renegade planet. He would be born as an innocent, helpless baby endure a life of sorrow and shame, and yet live a perfect and victorious life. Finally, he would die a humiliating death in order to stand as a substitute for fallen humanity. Through his sacrifice, mankind might amazingly be offered one more chance at eternal life. His blood would provide the ransom for the world that had been kidnapped by Satan. This wonderful plan of redemption was graphically illustrated in the system of animal sacrifices ordained by God after the fall of man. The Lord had warned Adam and Eve they would die the day they ate the forbidden fruit. So how was it that they remained alive? The Bible tells us that soon after their sin, God provided clothing for them in the form of animal skins. It's worthy of noting that Revelation refers to Jesus Christ as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This indicates that a lamb was slain that very day to prevent their immediate death. By faith in this sacrifice, their death sentence was symbolically transferred from themselves to the innocent creature. The lamb, of course, being a representation of Jesus. And so, a ray of hope was provided in a seemingly dark and hopeless situation. Through repentance and faith in the blood of the coming Messiah, any human could once again become a child of God. But in spite of this wonderful plan, for the time being, Satan would still have dominion of the earth, and life in this world would not be easy. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Many naturally wonder why a loving and all-powerful God permit sorrow and suffering in our world today. But it's clear from Genesis that God never intended for us to know the pain and trials of this life. As it came from God's hand, the earth was a wonderful paradise. It was the sin of Adam and Eve that gave Satan the right to claim control of this planet. Because of their tragic choice, the devil and his minions gained the power to tempt and torment humans, inflicting sickness, pain, and suffering. Perhaps a better question would be, why doesn't Satan have full control of humanity? The answer is Jesus Christ. You may already realize that Jesus' death on the cross provided each of us the opportunity to be saved. But in reality, it did much more than that. When the Savior offered his life to redeem the earth, that act placed restrictions on Satan's control over humanity. Satan could not force our will, and his power to harm us would be limited. Christ's sacrifice also brought us a time of probation where we can see for ourselves the difference between God's government and Satan's, and then decide who we would serve. Ultimately, because of Jesus' selfless sacrifice, Satan's kingdom will come to an end, and the earth will one day be returned to man more wonderful than it was at the beginning. So when Adam and Eve began their lives as exiles from paradise, they still had hope. God had provided the skins of sacrificed animals to cover their nakedness. But more importantly, He had promised the blood of the Lamb of God to cover their sin if they accepted Christ and repented. One big question remained. Would people accept God's generous gift How shall we escape 
if we neglect so great a salvation. The amazing story that you've just heard is true, and it affects you. Because of Satan's desire to be God, and Adam and Eve's distrust and disobedience to God, we all find ourselves in a perilous situation. On one hand, mankind has been greatly favored by God with a second chance to regain our Eden home. On the other, if we fail to take advantage of this wonderful opportunity, we become slaves to Satan and will ultimately be destroyed when God cleanses the universe of sin. Friends, there is no better time to make your decision for Jesus than right now. None of us know how long we might have to live on this earth. Our lives can end instantly. Jesus has shown great interest in your well-being, and His love for you moved Him to provide a way to escape from the coming destruction. He just asks you to accept Him, to repent of your sins. Through Christ, you can find pardon and receive a new heart to become like Him in character. The sobering news is that Satan is moving in every possible way to keep you from accepting God's gift of salvation. Through the busyness of life, the love of money, or some other fascinating distraction, he works to keep you occupied with anything but what really matters most, your eternal salvation. For you see, the reality of the situation is that if you don't choose Jesus, you will have, by default, chosen Satan. Although Adam and Eve's terrible choice brought untold death and misery, you now have a chance to make a better decision. God is offering you a peace that satisfies the deepest longing in your soul and a joy that will lift you above the trials of this world. The yearning desire of God's heart is for you to be saved and to be with Him in paradise. But the only one who can keep you out of heaven is you. Imagine how tragic it would be if you were needlessly to reject this precious gift. You can choose today to accept the salvation that God has promised. In fact, this very moment, you can accept everlasting life through Jesus Christ. Can I invite you to join me right now in a simple prayer accepting His wonderful offer? Please repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you now and humbly ask for your forgiveness. Lord, I confess that I am a sinner and I've broken your holy law. I realize that the penalty for sin is death. I believe that Jesus Christ suffered and died on the cross to take the punishment for all of my sins. I believe Jesus rose from the dead and I accept him as my personal savior. From this moment forward, I give you my heart and trust you to be the Lord of my life. Please forgive all of my sins and send your spirit to help me do your will. I thank you for your great love and accept your gift of eternal life. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.